female protocol officers went on trips to Kanilai with Yaya Jame. You, you told us um, the fact that you would all gather together either um, in the corridor or in the sitting room and an individual would be called or sometimes the individual would be called and you would all stay in your residence. And you told us the reason for that was um, for, the, um, for the president to have sex with those people. You also mentioned yeah. that um, some of the individuals that he called did not want that. And in fact, you mentioned one particular individual who told you about her experience including the fact that she tried to say no and in the end um, Yaya Jame punched her and ended up um, essentially raping her. You told us as well that um, a lot of these women were over the age of 18 or all of them that you recall um, as far as you could tell, we're over 18. Oh, yeah. So you said that some of the individuals did not want this, and examples being obviously what you were told. What about other yeah. individuals? Um, what would you say about, about some of the other people in the similar situation, some of the other protocol officers? Um, I know there are, like, like I told you, there were people who didn't want it, but I have also seen some people who wanted it. There were people who see that as pride, uh, even, even certain women trying to flirt around, you know, to get his attention. So for me, yes, there were girls who didn't want it. He took advantage of how vulnerable the women were. He had, he had money, he had power, he had the position, and he took that to his advantage to abuse the women. Can you um, can you give us a list of some of the individuals who went in, um, who were called separately by the by Yaya Jame at the time? Just a list of some of the individuals that you recall. Um, I think uh, I have that on names or. Yeah, 36, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42. Yeah. Those are the names that you recall. Yeah. Numbers 36 to 42. Yeah. Um, you told us that of course, some of them wanted um, to have such relationships with the president, others didn't, and you gave us examples. Can you tell us how Yaya Jame treated an individual that he had chosen um, to call into the room? How would he treat um, that person? What would you observe as a protocol officer? Um, with him, one thing is he gives he gives that person so much attention, so much gifts, you know, money and all that. But what of it was that he treated them like his own property. At the same time, he makes these people feel very special. And as I mentioned, he gives them a lot of money, phones, laptop, sometimes a house and even a car. But then you have to be ready to come to him whenever he wanted and anytime. So it 
it was more like being a sexual object to him. Out of the names that you've mentioned, um, I'm looking at paragraph 14 of the protected information sheet, that's number nine. There is a name that is mentioned, um, the first name. It wasn't part of the names that you identified, but do you know if that individual was called in um, by Yaya Jamid during these trips to Kanilai? Uh, can you come again, please? Paragraph 19? Um, number 9, paragraph 14. Okay. The first name. Okay, yes. She was one of the individuals that... I don't know, Mother. Okay. Thank you for confirming that. So can, you, can you tell us um, whether any of these um, women or these protocol officers, whether any of them had any consequences as a result of um, their sexual relationship with Yaya Jame, whether there were any consequences of um, actually, um, yeah, actually engaging in those relationships with Yaya Jame. Well, um, I know that when, when things do not work again, he was very good at taking, out, taking back what he gave to you. So in, in those cases, he took back the money. Sorry, he didn't take back the money. He took back the car. In other cases, he took back the laptop. And sometimes the, car, the, the house that he let you stay in, he, he sent you out. And for others, you even end up being dumped or sacked. I have seen things like that happen. What about um, other types of consequences um, that are medically related? Were there any such consequences yeah. that you recall? Yes, uh, I remember one of the one of the people or one of the young women who slept with him told me he did not use protection. And as a result of that, some got pregnant and they had to get rid of that because in other cases that it was realized you were pregnant, you were sent out of state house or wherever you were living and like, you must get rid of the pregnancy. You cannot know you were pregnant. Can you... Um point to the list for the name of the individual who told you about this. Yes. On paragraph 17. There's more than one name in that paragraph. Um, what were the experiences of those um, two individuals in that paragraph? Paragraph 17, which is number 11 on the list. Um, both of them got pregnant. And, uh, for example, one of them got her pregnancy terminated. And the one that spoke to me, I remember I went with her up to the hospital so that they could help her to get rid of it because it was risky for her. That was after seeing how they treated one of the girls who was actually not a protocol but was staying at the state house. After she got pregnant, they terminated her pregnancy and sent her back to the village. And for this other individual that spoke to me, she was at risk of her family being sent out and anything could have happened to her. So. He was not willing to take that risk. And just to make sure that we can identify each of these examples, can you list, um, can you give us the name of the examples that you've just given now from the list? And perhaps um, you can look at the back of the list if that helps. Uh, 
on number 36 was the individual that spoke to me and number 30, number 32 was the other girl that was not the protocol. Did you say number 32? Number, number 36. Number 36 is the one who you accompanied um, to get an abortion, is that right? Yes. And yes. the other person that you mentioned is number, number what exactly? 32. 32. There are two names in number 32. 32. 42. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, apart from the the experience, um, the general system you've described at Kanilai, um, was there any kind of um, phrase or any kind of cover that was used in order to get women to go to the president for sex? Was there something that was generally used or said, let's go and do X? Um, to capture this particular um, phenomenon or this to describe this experience? Well, mostly ginger or sex person, let's go for massage. Uh, that, that is also different from when we all have to go and sit at the veranda there. She just calls the individual and goes inside with the individual. But in other cases, when she had to go with one person, she says, let's go for massage. And how did you understand, let's go for massage? Well, mostly when she goes, uh, with my experience, and for those that spoke to me, it was to go for sex. It's possible some, some were just there to massage, which I cannot attest to, but to those that I know, it was for sex. Can you tell us about your own personal experience? Because you told us earlier that one of the reasons why you know that when an individual is called specifically to go to um, Yaya Jame's room or um, sitting room, it was for sex. Can you give us your own experience um, of what happened? Well, I remember there was a day in Kanilai. Can I just remind you to be, me. can I remind you just to be careful that, that you don't um, identify yourself? Um, bear that in mind when you're telling us what happened, including any name that may have been used to refer to you while this was happening. Yes. Just be mindful of that. Please continue. Thank you for, for reminding me of that. Um, I remember in Kanilai, that was shortly after I had, I had a trip with the president. And after the scholarship promises, we were in Kanilai and one evening Jimmy called me and said the president wanted to see me in his apartment. And when we got there, he asked me to undress. And this was very weird to me, but he told me because he had to do some spiritual bath for me, like ritual bath. So I felt like I am from a home where my father doesn't allow things like that. He never applied anything on us. He had the, he had the belief that the God that created you can always be the one who protects you. So when the president said this to me, I, I, I sort of appreciated it and I felt special that he wanted to, to protect me in a way that my parents didn't. And I can remember looking at him and saying, well, but it's okay because you are like my father. I am just, and we went to the bathroom, he covered me with something white and he had, an, like, incense, 
and the smoke made the room cloudy and we did as the ritual bath and Jindy was there and after that we went back. The next day again, before you proceed, we have to go. Before you proceed, yeah. do you recall around what time of the day this was when um, the president called you to give you a spiritual bath? This was at night, but I don't remember the actual time. And you said that inside the room, um, that it wasn't just you and the president, um, Jimbe was also there. Yes, she was. You said after he, um, there was smoke coming out, so incense smoke, and the room was cloudy. And you said yes. that you had a cloth around you, and then he did a spiritual bath. What what did that entail? What do you mean by spiritual bath? What exactly did he do? I don't know. It was water and some stuff. I don't know. For me, that was the first time to go through something like that. But he poured the water all over me from my head to toe. And he said, it was ready, now you can go. While he did that, did he touch you in any way or did he only pour the water over you? On the first day, maybe, but I did not realize anything like that. For me, it was just to, he covered me up and everything was normal. So you said, you said that you felt, you even appreciated it because you felt that he was trying to protect you by giving you a spiritual bath. And then you said to him, this is okay because you are like my father. Yes. After that, um, that particular incident, how did you feel when you went back to the residence? On that day, I, I felt special. And I was, I think I was happy. Being, being treated like that by, by the president, you know, that the president felt there was a need to protect me. It felt, it felt, it felt good. Can you tell us what happened? Um, you started to say then the next day. Can you tell us what happened the next day? The, pres the next day, the president called me back and Jimmy took me inside. And sorry, he just told question. me again to, to undress, which whenever, I did. Sorry, just to interrupt you. Whenever you say the president called me and then Jimbe took me, how does the president call you? Does he call you directly or does he go through Jimbe? Just to clarify that. Yeah, it's through Jimbe. So it's Jimbe who comes and says, the president wants you to go. So please continue. What happened on that, um, that, was it the day or the night time? It was at night. Can you tell us what happened when you went on this second occasion? Well, we went again and he asked me to undress and I did, but this time it was, it was something different. He even looked at me and said, well, you look like a primary school girl. And he started touching my body, my breast, and it was awkward for me. And I remember that I started crying and I was pushing back, going back to an extent. It was the end, there was the wall. And he was like, what happened? And Jimmy said to him, um, be mindful she is here. like this. Okay, please continue. Yeah. She, yeah, she is like this. She is very shy. But I know I had learned a lot at that time when it comes to sexual violence, when it comes to being assertive, when it comes to saying no without hurting the individual. So I tried doing this. I said, no, I am not a shy person. But I see you like my father, and I didn't accept this from you. But maybe I was wrong 
for him you cannot try to be a sadist. And maybe that was what made him angry and and I have to pay for that. How did you he react me when back. you told him? How did yeah. how did he react? You said he was angry. What did he what did he do or say? He said take her out of here. And I was gone and I remember the day I was shaking, I was too scared. And in the morning, I was told I had to go back home. And the driver, the driver came for me and took me home. So and essentially, you were expelled from. He, he terminated my. He terminated my scholarship. And he didn't want to see me again. So essentially, from what you've said. Because you refused um, his advances, um, he was touching you, you told us about that. His reaction mm -hmm. was to be angry, and the next day you were expelled from Panilai and told to go home. And another consequence was that your scholarship, the one he had promised you, was terminated. Is that right? That is correct. How did you feel um, about that? This was difficult for me, but I didn't have a choice. This was this was a job I needed. And so many people out there will be like, why did you why did you continue doing the job? It was not as easy as they think. You cannot just leave the job like that. One thing was clear. If you wanted to leave the job that was to resign, then you must you must be away. And then, with my situation, I had a family to help. So I wanted to still be in the job and still fight for myself. But I was treated badly by him. And from that day, I rarely saw him. It was only when there were programs or occasions or things like that that I would see him. He stopped helping me. He stopped offering me any sort of support. And it was difficult seeing him do things for others, for others, not everyone, but you know, you see a particular girl and then you know the person was getting certain things, not because she was working better than you, not because she was more hardworking than you, but because she was sleeping with him. And then you were, like, I was sidelined. That was difficult for me. And to be honest, to an extent, I started feeling jealous of the others. And I started saying to myself, maybe I was wrong. Maybe I should have accepted it. And then I will not be going through this. I just want to refer the commissioners to um, num uh, numbers 16 to 19 on the protected information sheet. I'm, refer I'm referring the commissioners to um, the information in the protected information sheet. So numbers 16 to 19, which represent paragraphs 26 to 28, where there is additional information about um, the consequences that um, the witness faced as a result of refusing um, Yaya Jaime's advances. Um, Madam Witness, you told us that you stayed in the job because it wasn't difficult to just get up and leave, but also you needed the money because you were helping to take care of your family. Is that right? Yes. And then you've talked about um, being essentially isolated and sidelined, um, and you didn't receive any of the other gifts that other people received during that time. Okay. At that point in time, did you um, did you take any other measures? Did you um, 
did you continue to do your work as a protocol officer fully, including going on trips um, with the president? You know, because for me, later it made no sense. There were times that we, we go to Kanilai, and for example, there were days that we all go together to his apartment and sleep, but most of the time I would be sleeping at night, like we were all sleeping and you know, when he calls, it's always at late. And in the middle of the night, I wake up and I don't see anyone else in the room. I don't know for what reason Jindy was the one calling us to go, but the isolation was, was too tense. And later I said to myself, it makes no sense for me to even go. So when it was time to go, I found many excuses. Some of the times I said things like we had a funeral or I had so much ache. And I refused to go. I didn't want to go there. And I remember one of the days, like, my one of my colleagues called and said, leave whatever you are doing and come to Canela. Don't cause a problem for yourself. So it was clear later that I didn't want to go. I was always... Absent, I always said something was wrong because I was tired of it. it he didn't, he didn't need me there anymore. Do you recall for how long um, this kind of isolation and sidelining? How long it lasted before um, Yai Jama started taking an interest in you again? Yeah, it took some time. Until, until on one occasion, when I congratulated him on, on a gesture he did, and I think he was impressed, and he said I was the first one to do that. That was, that was a day like he, he pardoned prisoners, and I said congratulations, because for me that was, that was an achievement. Those were people, like many people said, he killed them. And when he released those people, I said to myself, maybe we were wrong. He didn't kill those people. And I said, congratulations. And he said, come here and hug me. I did that. And he asked me to sit by his side. I did. But he held my hand. And then he was caressing my palm with his finger, you know. I, I, I know about those things. I learned about them. So it was odd for me. But in a respectful way, I tried to withdraw my hand from him and even manage to, to get up from his, uh, his couch. I, didn't, I was not thinking he would notice that. But that also angered him because just before that I was working on a project and I had all the invoice and everything. He said he was going to pay for that. He even already asked me to to bring the receipt and everything. And then all of a sudden in the morning again I was told I had to go home. And I went back home. And that was that was a time when he wanted me to to apply for another school, which I did after he cancelled the other one. And he, he didn't want to talk about this other scholarship again, and then he would not want to see me again. So essentially this was... The he ignored me. Mm -hmm. Please continue. Yes. So essentially, this was the second time that um, Yai Jam was making some kind of advance towards you, um, either sexually or something that just made you feel um, that it was inappropriate, and you withdrew, and essentially the consequence again was the first time was termination of your scholarship. At this time, essentially, he no longer wanted to talk about helping you 
fund your school, is that correct? Oh, yes. The first one was cancelling my termination, uh, my, my scholarship, and, and, and something also more difficult. But. Can you repeat that? I, I think I missed what you said last. Yeah, the first time was he cancelled my scholarship and he reacted in other ways, which, which I may not be able to, to reveal here. I, I have referred the commissioners to paragraphs 26 um, onwards, and um, I believe that's what you're referring to, the additional consequences that you faced. Paragraphs 26 to 28. Yes. Thank you. Um, one question that I have generally about, um, you've explained to us the system that was in place in relation to um, protocol officers, and you told us how mm -hmm. Yaya Jame would interact with female protocol officers. What about when you went on tour, um, nationwide tours? or you attended public gatherings. Um, were there any women that would either join your group? If yes, how would that happen? Uh, yes, that happened. Sometimes women that were not part of us will join, will join us. And I recall an incident when when, when, when one of our officers, I don't know if I should mention him or not. Um, I believe you can, okay. you can refer us to the paragraph on the protected information sheet. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not actually following the no, that's fine. Um, I, from what I can see on the statement, this is not someone who is protected um, because the person is not a victim or um, a survivor. So you can mention the person's name. Yes, I remember on one of the occasions when, when my former chief of protocol, Sana Jadi, so, like, one of the girls was in the gathering and he asked me to go and check the girl's number because the girl used to be his classmate. But it could, I can't, be, I, I might be wrong. I remember seeing that girl in Kanilai later going to the president. And on other occasions, when you saw we were on tour. When you saw that girl yeah. going to um, the president's residence, um, what did you think, looking back at the fact that Sanajaju had asked you to take the number for, um, well, for him, because um, that person was a former classmate. What did you think the next day when you saw the girl um, coming from the president's residence? Well, for me, for me, it was obvious that why would he handpick a girl from the gathering? So it was clear that he wanted her for sex. Do you recall if this, I mean, sometimes it's difficult to tell just by looking at a person, but do you recall if this individual was over 18 or um, below 18? She was, she was definitely above 18. You started to give us another example. Can you tell us? Yeah, I remember once there was this light skin girl. Uh, we were on tour somewhere around Bathe, and Jimby, Jimby approached her and took her, her number. And later in the morning, she came out with, with an en envelope, which I suppose was money, was a lot of money. And I said to myself, that's another one. What do you mean by that's another one? That's another woman. He, 
he just saw and took advantage of. And same question as I asked you before, do you recall if this woman was above 18 or below 18? Uh, I think she was above 18. So these two incidents that you've mentioned, um, I assume that you do not know the names of these individuals, is that correct? Yes, that is correct. So I would like to focus on specific interactions that Yaya Jame had with um, certain women that you know of. Mm -hmm. You mentioned earlier about someone in someone who was listed as um, number 36 on the protected information sheet. Yes. Can you tell us, um, you told us earlier that this person informed you of um, an occasion where the president called her, she tried to refuse and she was punched, and then the okay. president basically raped her at that point. You said she told you about yeah. it. Um, can you tell us yes. um, about any other information that she may have provided you regarding what else happened to her? Well, she told me that he was not protecting himself. And for me, that was very risky. In my past, I was more scared of diseases and rituals, I don't know for what reason. I, I know at the time I spoke to very few people about the incident and they were men and they, took, they always they always encouraged me to make sure that under no circumstance I agree to do it because it's possible he might be doing it for some, for, for some sort of rituals. It, it was too much for me. You cannot have peace for every woman. And the fact that he was not protecting himself makes it worse. Do you, um, can you tell us whether while you were present um, with this individual, whether at any point she was called to go to um, to go to State House to because the because Yaya Jame called for her. You told us already about yeah. one incident that she told you about um, when we talked about Kani Lai, but can you um, do you recall anything happening in relation to State House itself? Yes, I remember when the president once like she he never calls Barrett. It was Jindy who called her and said that. She had to go to the state house. On that day, I was with her because we had a delegation to take care of at the hotel, and and she had to go that night. It was about 2 p.m. and I I could see how terrible it was for her. Sorry, was because, it 2 p.m.? You know, Did you say 2 p.m.? Around 2 p.m. Yeah. Sorry, 2 a.m. Okay, so early hours of the morning. Yeah. What were you doing at that time? Uh, we were at the hotel. We had a delegation to take care of. And we were already sleeping. And I remember this was a woman who, like, we had that trust for each other. And I told her about what I was going through. And she told me what she was going through. And when the call came, she, she hesitated to even receive the call. Because when, when Judy called you that time of the night, it's obvious she wanted you to go. She didn't want to go, but there was nothing we could do. So she left, she went, and I saw her the next day. She, she told me, I don't like what is happening, but I don't know what I have to do. So 
So from what she said, when, yeah, Jamie was the one taking care and helping her family. So from what you've said, she didn't want to do this, or she didn't want to go, but she felt that she had no choice. Is that right? Yeah. Can you tell us about another, um, and perhaps I should just refer the commissioners to the entire paragraph in your statement, and that would be um, paragraphs 36 and 35 and 36, which are numbers 25 and 26 on the protected information sheet. Um, that's the incident that uh, Madam Witness was just talking about. Apart from that individual, do you recall any other specific examples of um, Yaya Jame's interactions with um, other women or girls? Uh, yes. Yes, I do. Please tell us about them. Um, I know he was this man, okay, for me, I used to see him like a father figure, like like a great religious leader, a true African, you know, but the day that that incident happened and that led to him terminating my scholarship or canceling my scholarship was the last day I saw that person the person that I used to love so much. And I was disappointed because he doesn't talk, you know. He says this thing today to the public and then you see him doing those particular things. I remember he, he once asked the religious leaders at one of the Quranic programs what, what do they think about married men being with other women and that was very awkward because for me he was doing the same thing so i saw him going with with other women to his house and he treated them very nice but he was good at that he treats you like you are the one i am interested in you i will marry you and all of a sudden he dumps you and then you will struggle to see him. You can't see him anymore. You see him with somebody else. So he starts with this one, and then maybe he doesn't have interest anymore. He is interested in another person. So he creates an environment of jealousy and hatred within the women. Do you recall any specific examples um, where he did that? And if you do, please refer us to the relevant portion of your protected information sheet. Uh, yes, uh, I know the names. Uh, someone like number 37 and someone number, number, yeah, number 41. Is On paragraph 37. Is that the information that's contained um, in number 28? So the name referred to in paragraph 37 as well as the information contained in paragraph 38. Is that what you're referring to? Yes. As an example of um, what you've just explained to us. Yeah. Um, do you recall any other examples of um, Yaya Jami's interactions with specific women based on what you know? Well, I know, I know I have seen in situations where, where he abused, like he has sexual relationships with, with people who are related by blood. He doesn't care. And that created chaos that made those, 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 those women who are related even to start hating each other. And I also know it's possible there were other women who said me to him. 
But I know that one particular woman who said no to him, and then he always will face the consequences. Let's take that step by step. You mentioned that sometimes um, he would he would basically have sexual relations with two people or sleep with two people who were related by blood. Yes. Yeah. Can you give us um, examples based on your protected information sheet? Uh, on paragraph 39. And, uh, and that person... And the name, yeah, the that name of the people on 41 and 42. So 41 and 42, what was their relationship? They were sisters, blood sisters. And in terms of 39, who was the other person? What, what was the relationship with 39? That was her sister, the same mother and father. And um, you also, in your statement, you referred to people who were related to him, who were also sisters. Yes. Are we referring to paragraph 18? Is that accurate? I cannot hear you. Are you referring to paragraph 18, which is point number 12, is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And you've told us that some of these individuals um, were protocol officers, some were not. Is that right? Yes, that is right. Because I know of one of his family members who got pregnant out of the affairs she was having with him. Sorry, just to be clear, what happened to that person? I know she was pregnant and later it was aborted when she left. You, sorry, can you refer to the name of that individual so we know who you're talking about? Is it, um, are you referring to any of the names on paragraph 18, which I just referred to? Paragraph what? Paragraph 18, which is number 12 on the protected information sheet. Exactly. It's the third name there. The third name on that list. Okay. You also mentioned that um, you know of other people who refused and um, suffered consequences as a result of refusing to um, to sleep with the president. Yes. Um, can you tell us about that, or can you refer us to any examples? Um, she is the one I mentioned on paragraph 42, and she was a protocol officer, and she refused to sleep with him. I, I can't remember well whether she was the one who told me or one of her friends who was also working with us. But at, at the point, I noticed that she was also not receiving anything from him. But if I am right, she was, she was the one who told me that she went to him and then he started touching her hand inappropriately and she didn't like that. That was when he, at first, he started calling her to go to Canela, you know, he would pick her and do stuff and gave her money. And later he did those advances and in the end, she ended up being trapped. You said it's the person listed in paragraph 42. Would that be the same person in number 40 of the list? Yes. Yeah. What about the person listed as number 39 on your list? Yeah, I also know her. 
Can you tell us what happened to her without revealing, of course, her identity? Uh, I know she was also promised a scholarship and there was a time when I was sent back home. We were going together and she was crying and I don't really want to reveal much about her, but it was as a result of a sexual abuse. And to be clear, you're referring to the information contained in paragraph 41, and that would be um, paragraph 41 of your statement, which would be point number 31. Yes. Okay. What about the person listed as number 38 on the list? Can you tell us about her? bearing in mind um, identifying information. Can you tell us about... Yes, for me, I, I, don't, I don't really know if the president raped her because one thing about rape is when the person uses his power over, over you to have sexual relationship, it is rape. And the fact that I was not inside the room but I know, yeah, Jama used to give this person so much attention, and she comes to penalize, and I don't know how many times. So one thing Claire was, he was really taking advantage of the vulnerability of this young woman. He provides support to you, to your family, gives you money, gives you, gives you phones, and it's possible he did which I, I know nothing about. Just to be clear, are you referring to the person listed as number 37 or the person listed as number 38 on your list? Number 37. Can you tell us about the person listed as number 38? Um, I know she was, she was younger. Number 38, you mean? Yes, please. What do you mean by she was younger? Was she above or below? No, I, I didn't. I thought you said the other one. I mean the one on number 38. Yes. Do you recall if number yeah, she's 38... Yes, the one I just told you about. Do you recall if number 38 was below the age of 18 or above the age of 18? Well, at that time, I... I think she would have been the same age with me or maybe older. So, in if the you, early 20s then. Mm, if you have your statement in front of you, I'm referring to the information contained in paragraph 40. In paragraph 40? 40, 40, yes. Okay, yeah, I know this individual and she was she was a much younger one because when I was working, she was, yeah, she was young and she was under 18 years old. And, but she was one of those young women who were, or children who were empowered. And she must have known a lot also about violence against women and children. So, she was very calm, and I heard she also refused because I did not discuss that. But I heard she refused to sleep with the Jame, and later she was expelled from state house, and that was very bad because why would somebody be treated that way just because she refused to sleep with you? To me, I see that girl and. Even myself, as people who just respected him and gave him his due, and wished he could respect us the same way. You told us that she was below 18. Do you recall if she was in primary or secondary school at the time? She was in secondary school. And you said um, she was expelled from State House. Was she living? 
at Marena or was she living somewhere else? She was living at Marena. You said um, she was expelled and based on what you saw, um, you interpreted it as she refused the president. She refused to have um, any sexual relationship with the president and that's why she was expelled. Is that what you said? Yes. Yeah. Why do you think that? With him, the consequences will always come. So, it's either he, he stops supporting you, sends you out, fails his promises that he made, especially when it comes to education. So it was certain that that was the reason he did that. You mentioned um, Jimbe Jame as the person who would basically be an intermediary between protocol officers and other women and Yaya Jame. As far yeah. as you know, were there any other individuals who would assist Yaya Jame in um, getting women, getting girls in order to have sexual relationships with them? or to rape them, as the case may be? Well, I know she was the Cindy was the number one that was doing this, and... Sorry, say that again? What, there, there was, I, was, I know Jindy was the one doing that, and that was my experience. There was, there was one time when, when my former chief of protocol asked me to take one of the girls' number, And I later saw that that girl in the morning from the president. But in most cases, it was Jimmy. So as far as you recall, um, Jim Day was one person, and you've mentioned um, the chief of protocol at the time. Do you recall any other individuals who would um, play a role in helping Yaya Jame get women? Um, but I don't know much about him. What about, um, on those occasions, what about um, the First Lady? Where was she when these um, incidents, when these things were happening? Do you know? that the witness has disconnected can we can we have some assistance to know what has happened Madam Witness, can you hear me? Yes, yeah, I can hear you. Um, I'm glad that we, we have you on the line still. Um, I'm looking mm -hmm. at your statement. Do you have it in front of you? Yes. Yeah. I'm looking at paragraph 43. Hello? Can you hear me? I'm looking at paragraph 43 and 44. Yes. Yeah. I want to understand um, the information that you've provided. Um, can you tell us about that, as well as how you know um, the information contained there? With the names as well. Yes, please go ahead. Yes, um, that is one about uh, Lamin Manga, the former press secretary. 
uh, he was very close to Jimby and Yaya Jame and I think he knows a lot when it comes to Yaya Jame and women because I know that there was this one woman who, who sometimes comes to the country and it was through him. Um, you recall just one woman? Is that what you said? Yes, but I know one thing that he was really close to Jimmy. And so why do you believe that yeah, apart yeah, from, why do you believe that apart from this one woman who um, would come to Gambia that he would know a lot more about Yaya Jame and women? Yeah, because they were always together and when there were occasions, uh, there were some invitations that were for, for certain women coming out of the Gambia that he, he took care of. So there were women um, coming from other countries that would come to the Gambia on occasions and those are women that he would know about because those women um, you believe interacted with Jame sexually. Is that what you've said? Yes. Uh, I forgot to mention this to you when my statement was taken, but on an occasion I I was even the one who accompanied Jimmy to the airport to receive one of the women. And um, you can provide us with that, with the name after your testimony. Um, because there's no way to have you write it and give it to us right now, so we'll do it after your testimony. Um, what okay. about the information in paragraph 44? Can you tell us about that? Um, that is about the jungle. Uh, for me, it's, it's very strange because I didn't know about them. We used to hang out with them. I used to hear the name jungle. But it was something, after hearing everything, I was, I, I would never have believed those were, those were things in existence. So we really hung out with them and we were doing things we ate with them. I remember people like Malik and Noha, those names. I don't know their second names, but I also know Sanamanjang, even though I didn't have interactions with him. When you say we were hanging out with the junglers, um, what does that mean? First of all, who is we, and um, what do you mean by hanging out? Like we, the protocol officers, we see them when they were programmed. At Kanilai, we sit with them. You see, uh, we see them as normal people. Yeah, not knowing, not knowing the jobs they were doing. So it was even. <laughs> I don't know, it, it, it is scary to know that we were surrounded by people like that. So they would attend some of the programs at Kanilai um, that you and other protocol officers were also attending. And from what you've said at the time, you didn't know um, who they were or what they were really doing. Is that correct? No. And you know when we had occasions, like we are there for days or sometimes months, um, up to a month. So the the place there was big and you see a lot of them. But for me, I never had known this is what this person was doing. This, these people are killing our people or things like that. I never, I never knew about that. But later when I started hearing the names, I know I, I can recall Nuha and Malik and Kosana Manjang, of course I know him. But as you said, you never had any um, direct interaction with, um, with them? No. 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 While you were a protocol officer at the office of the president, did you, apart from the examples you've given us and your interactions with um, Yaya Jame, did you experience any other um, form of sexual violence or any um, sexual harassment from other public officials? 
Yes. Can you tell us about that and can you refer us um, to the name in the list? Okay, this individual works at the Ministry of Justice and he is on Paris uh, on number 45 and he still works there. Um, I remember when I was working on one of my projects, I went to I went to his office for help after calling him to go through what I was doing. And I went, when I went there, he he opened his office and I was inside. It's an isolated place, and he locked his door. And then he started behaving behaving in a very different way, and. He started asking me, do you like bananas? I didn't understand what was going on. And all of a sudden, he's an elderly person. He took out his penis. And he asked me to touch it. He was even pulling my hand to touch that. And that was difficult. I just, for me, in such situations, I just want to escape that. And I told him, please let me go. I have something to do at work. I will come back here. And then when I left, that was the last day I went to him. I remember I saw him not long ago in Gambia. And he asked for my number again. And I gave him a wrong number. And I'm sure maybe, I don't know, maybe he is listening. It's possible he is doing it to other young women. Which I feel is very unfair. But I know he's listening and... Unless the cases are similar, he will know who is talking. Can you tell us why you feel it is important to um, talk about these instances, these incidents of sexual violence? I know there are many women who are in my situation. I know there are many women who want better lives for themselves. And I know that there are men out there who have power, who have authority, and they will take advantage of them. But I just want to tell them, okay, they can do this today, but they might face it tomorrow. And because I don't want it to happen to other women, I don't want my sisters to even need support from men like those. Because I will not say every man. I have, I have very great men in my life, men who guided me through men who stood by me, and men who will always stand there and protect the women. But that is majority are there to sexually abuse women, to take advantage of the situation. And I still go back to vulnerability. They just, they look at your situation and think they can take advantage of you. And I don't want this to happen to other women out there. For me, it's not, um, it's not, it's not, it's not something I enjoy. Nobody enjoys sitting here talking about a person tried to do this to me or that to me. But I believe I must do it for others. I, I believe there are women out there who are going through the pressure, who are going through the pain. And I want to tell them it, 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 it's possible to challenge your, those men. It's possible to, to stand up for what you believe and and make them pay for that. Because for me, important is these men have to know what they did and if possible, pay for what they did. And this, this one person is someone, you know, normally there are even people who appear to be the ones to protect us. There are people who sit there and when the public is there, they, they say all sort of things. They pretend like they are there for the women. They pretend like they are protecting women. When in fact, they are the ones exploiting them. And you told us that you managed to escape and you even promised to return in order to just get out of um, this public official's office. Do you think the fact that um, you were a protocol officer at the time was one of the reasons why you were able to assert yourself, or was there another reason for that? 
Well, I know for sure it could be with the job as well, but even before that, I was taught to be a baby. I was taught to how to how to escape certain situations. I know I learned something that was when you go to a place, how do you feel about it? Do you feel good or not? That is whether you have a yes or no feeling. And if you know you feel no, you must do everything possible to take yourself out. And the second thing I ask myself, if I need help, will I get it? And if it is no, I still should try to get myself out of the situation. And whether someone I trust knew where I was. And this is something that, for our younger ones that are coming up, this is something they should really take care of. Anywhere you go, always, always, always keep those questions at the back of your mind. Is it safe enough? How do you feel about it? If you need to escape, are there possibilities? And whether anyone knows where you are? Because they are everywhere and they can do it. So it's possible that it, it is from the job. I, I was empowered. But also it has more to do with some training that I received as a young person and 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 that I learn I learned certain things about how to how to really stay to what I wanted and and to be a certain Were some of these trainings specifically on sexual violence or um, on other issues? Well, most of them were on sexual violence, on how to protect women and children. So, in one way or the other, they always had something to do with sexual violence, sexual abuse, rape, things like that. And so that gave you awareness as well as some of the tools that you used whenever you were in, um, in such a situation? Yes. Yeah. Apart from the incidents that you've mentioned, um, are there any other incidents where you faced um, sexual violence or sexual harassment from any other public officials? Uh, yes. One of them was a minister. And I remember we were on a trip. We had to travel together abroad. And that was that was difficult because there was a problem at home and I had to leave about eighty percent of my podium back home. And when we were going he knew I could not afford to pay for the hotel. They were going to like they were higher dignitaries, they were ministers. And he started since the beginning he started messaging, saying stuff and when we arrived, he asked me where I was going. The place I was going to was more like a motel, not a hotel, because it was cheaper. But he said I should go with him and stay with him at his hotel room, and he would pay everything for me. He would give me whatever I wanted. But I told him, no, I had my money, so I had somewhere to stay. And on that mission, I had some documents for him, because there were some documentations. But during the day, whenever I called him and said, Sir, I have your documents. Can I please come and bring them? He said he was busy. And he would only call me late at night to bring them. And when I said, No, it is late, he said, No, yeah, I will call my driver to bring to, to come and pick you up and then you can spend the night with me. And that was happening. I could not give him his documents until I was getting fed up and he was only calling at night saying things like, you know, I, I think you're very attractive, I like you, this and that. And one day I decided to go up to his hotel during the day when they had a break. And I decided to give him his document and told him, please, your, your boss, the same person that appointed you, was the same person who appointed me here. So I want you to give me that respect. And I remember from that day on, I don't talk to this this particular minister again. Even during cabinet meetings, he tries to make jokes or things like that. Whenever he says something, I I reply back with a word or feel. 
but in a very intensive way. I remember I spoke to certain people about this, some of my colleagues, and I don't talk to that minister. Can you um, refer us to your list to tell us the name of this particular minister? He is on number 46. Number 46, thank you for that. After the experiences that you've told us about, um, in particular what happened um, between you and former President Yaya Jame, when you um, refused um, to sleep with him or refused other sexual advances, you eventually left the Gambia and I would only refer the commissioners to paragraphs 47 to 56 as listed in point number 35 of the protected information sheet and then we will come to the last topic which is the impact that all of this has had on you, on your family, um, and generally how you feel about the experiences that you've been through today. Um, can you tell us some of the impact that this has had? Um, more especially on my education, and feeling bullied all the time and being sidelined. And it went to an extent of like making me feel like to envy other people and being being away from my family was traumatic it was difficult for me and my mother ended up getting ill like she she became a totally different person because they used to call her sometimes in the middle of the night and I had high hopes, high hopes of becoming something in the future. Somebody promised me scholarship and, and this was going to shape my future well, but he decided not to go ahead with this just because, just because I said no to him. And when I, when I got here, I was on some occasion taken to the hospital. In Gambia, I, I, I received psycho, psychological support and I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And sometimes when, I, when I'm sleeping, it's people laughing at me, people do all horrible things. And, and I remember it went to an extent. I, I tried crazy things to to just get rid of it. to get rid of everything. Because I always sit here and start thinking why why did I allow them to bully me? Why did I allow the president to do this? If if he was not willing to support me, I was already studying. If it, I was already willing to do better for myself. If he was not not ready to to support my education, why did he make promises? Why did he break them? Just because I would not sleep with him. And and my family also had to suffer for it. People, I don't interact much. Most of my friends, maybe they think I feel like I am better than them or something, but it makes me a bit scared of people and and sometimes when like other people don't even mean to bully me or make me feel bad about myself but I react quickly. I I don't easily take it as a joke. I don't allow it when anyone wants to belittle me or make me feel bad. I wanted to be out there, I wanted people to see me. But now I don't even I don't even enjoy the company of people. I have been isolated enough that I, I now enjoy it.
Of course, we haven't gone into details of what happened to you after you left the Gambia and um, that experience as well, how that would have, um, what are some of the medical, um, medical or psychosocial consequences that this has had? Um, were you diagnosed with any kind of um, issues that you'd like to talk about or, um, or that you experienced as a result of um, the cumulative experiences that you Yeah, I, I know I am being diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And, you know, it's difficult when you even hear. I have seen, I have seen this and sometimes they talk and they say, something is wrong with you, you are sick, you are this. And because of that, they were times that I locked myself inside and I had overdoses and even thanks to my family, they, they tried to help me to get out of the situation. I, I, I cut myself and there was a day I totally wanted to get rid of myself and and I remember my brother came to my rescue and and he called the ambulance service and they came for me. And um, throughout your experience, you've, um, you've obviously had periods where you've been isolated, but you've also had um, support from your family, including um, support for your testimony today. Um, can you tell us how you feel about, um, about testifying about what happened to you and why you chose to do so in the end? It was a difficult decision for me, but I know I have a very supportive family. My husband is always by my side. My mom, my father, my brother, my sisters, everyone. It's too much. They, they, they've been through a lot and any type of assault or violence because of your gender. And I want those men to know that one day it will come out and that is what is happening today. Those men didn't think that some, a day like this would come. And it was a difficult journey and a very difficult decision for me to come out and talk. But I realized that if I if I just had to keep everything to myself, it was it was going to empower them. It was it will not mitigate the situation. They will keep doing that. So I'm sure today maybe they are hearing this and they will be a bit more cautious and a little bit more careful of things they will do. Because I know certain certain people are there, they are still working. They are still in the Thank you very much for answering all of my questions, Madam Witness. I'm sorry that you had to go through such difficult experiences and the, ex the impact that this has had on your life has clearly been profound, but I would like to thank you for testifying and for answering my questions. I will hand over yeah, to the commissioners you. for additional questions. Um, just to remind it's all necessary to ask a question that is um, related to confidential information, please um, use your protected information sheet. Thank you very much. Mr. Chairman, I hand over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, um, Council. And uh, thank you, uh, Madam Witness. The Kanilai Love Nest was indeed a house and my folk. I cannot hear you very well. Should I continue? Can I continue Hello? now? Can you hear me? Uh, Madam Witness, yeah. can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. 
sorry, I was saying that uh, the Kanenlai Love Nest was indeed a house for abuse of young, vulnerable women. This should not have um, happened. My uh, truly sorry that you had to endure such um, uh, sexual abuse uh, from people who were doing nothing but exercising power over young, vulnerable women. Truly sorry about it, and uh, uh, thank you very much indeed for being very brave and strong to come and testify before us on this very difficult issue in the country here. Uh, commissioners, if you have any questions to ask, please so indicate. Bishop, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, Madam Witness, with all those incidents that happened in Kanilai, where was the First Lady? I don't hear that. With all those incidents that happened in Kanilai, where yes. was the First Lady? The First Lady, in most cases, she was always out of town. Um, I remember some occasions she, she came to Kanulai, but I can't remember at any point in time when she spent the night there. Um, the second, uh, uh, further to that, uh, does that mean that um, she was not aware of um, uh, those things that were happening in uh, marital home? Uh, that I, I cannot tell. It's possible because I used to I used to say this to myself. Is this a contract marriage? Do they have an a, an agreement or what? Because I will not do that. I will not. And uh, there were so many people writing on Facebook, and she was active on Facebook. So to 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 an extent. With, with the wall of technology and a woman who had a Facebook account and a Facebook page and people were writing all sort of things, I don't believe there was there was a possibility that she was not aware of what was happening. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Um, uh, Deputy uh, Chair, you have the floor, please. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Madam Witness. <coughs> Uh, the chairman has already alluded to the misuse of power by people who have power to use this power empowered through various socialization processes to be able to say no to people in power. Now my question is just a very brief one. Is in respect of the two sisters, do you know how this impacted on their family relationships? Well, I don't know their family particularly, but I know it was not a nice relationship. Even people who are not related by blood do not want to share a man. Such as people who were related by blood. And for me, I don't believe in blaming, blaming a, a victim. In as far as the person use his power and use his authority or whatever, I will not blame the woman. I blamed him. He knew what he was doing was wrong, and he did it. Thank you, Madam Witness. Thank you very much indeed, Dr. Uh, Commissioner Jones, I understand you wonderful. Please go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. Madam Witness, can you hear me? I cannot hear you. Um, you now? Yes. Okay, you told the commission that for international travels, um, you guys took turns as to who would accompany the president on some of those trips. No, I cannot hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. You told the commission that for international travels, mm -hmm. you would take turns on who would accompany the president. For the national yeah. travels, travels within the country, 
did all the protocol officers, female protocol officers? So except for those who were on maternity leave or, or for some reason, I don't know, but in most cases, everyone goes. Okay. You further told the commission that um, you discussed with at least some of the protocol officers, not all of them. Was what? It, you also told the commission that you discussed with some of the female protocol officers as to the experiences or what happened between them and President Jamie. I don't know what you said. I'm sorry. C can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Um, during some of your discussions, um, did it also come out mm -hmm. that during some of your discussions with um, the female protocol officers, did it come out that Jembe was always present during um, the encounters with Jame? Uh, I think Jimbe was there until she knows everything was okay and then she leaves. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, oh, Imam C, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Hello? Thank you, Madam Witness. Hello? The disappointments and the betrayals that you experienced. Do you not think that you, the ladies, could have killed him if you were not scared? Uh, maybe that was a possibility, but for me, violence doesn't stop violence. And he was doing that. He, he was powerful, but... I believe God, God is more powerful than him, so he had the power to do that, and even if I could kill him, I will not do that. The life belongs to God. So I only had a belief that God will judge him, and and it's happening in a way that God did it. God, God has not waited for us to go to the next world. He's already doing it here. We are going through tough times. It's difficult for me. It's difficult for other women. But it's more difficult for him because this is a shame for him. Thank you very much indeed. And uh, if you have any closing remarks, I'm to make. I just want to stress at the TRRC, the powerful people, former ministers and men in uniform have testified to the fact that it is impossible to say no to Yaya Jamil. His closest associate feared him and Jungle has said that Jamil had ordered the killing of his own relatives. Rumors said that he even ordered the mother of a soldier who was expecting a baby for him. Please remember all of this and try to understand how and Connie and Using his position of authority, he put a system in place using state institutions and resources to ensure that women would not or could not say no. For me, his system was wicked. And he targeted young women from vulnerable families. Most of the time, these young women were the ones supporting their entire family. He sometimes even directly supported the family, appearing as a generous benefactor. He made you believe that he was a father to you or a mentor. He made promises of education and scholarship, and we all longed for a better life. And it is at that time that when the confidence was built that he made his sexual demands in the tour. If you said no, he makes sure you suffered, humiliates you, makes others to believe in you, and this is my story. Others tell that they had no choice but to accept his advances because 
and become his sexual slave, that he could call whatever he felt like it, even in the middle of the night. I witnessed that. Some others believe that when he was making his promises and fell for them, because he was killed and making you believe that you were special and that he had real interest in you, only to be dumped after a short time and treated badly by his entourage. And I witnessed that as well. Yeah, Jamie's tactics was to rule and divide, and Jimby used the same technique with us. We mistrusted each other, and it was hard to find someone to confide in. Working for Jamie meant constant stress, constant anxiety, and no one to turn to. So I am here to call on all Gambian people to please stop blaming the women and being judgmental and know that the least you can do for a victim is be supportive. As the expert on sexual violence said here, our society always blames the girls and the women. When in fact the ones to condemn are the men who are abusing their position of authority for their own pleasure. Because the practice did not just set a state house, it is a societal problem that affects every layer of our society. Myself, I had to endure sexual assault and harassment, not only from the Ayajanis, but from other senior officials. And today, I have mustered all the courage that I have and that God has given me to testify here with the hope that never again would also concern sexual violence in our country. Myself, I have been sexually harassed by so many men today. And these are men in position. These are men I gave examples of. People like Osman, I don't want to go, but okay. People like Osman Tonko is already out. I have gone through so much anxiety so much fear and as I speak to you, I shake wondering what people will say about me, but it's okay because I have decided to be strong because this is bigger than me. I feel very insecure about my sisters because this happens everywhere and I don't want them to experience anything like I had gone through. I have, I, I just want to call on women to find the strength to speak out about what they had experienced or what what they are still going through. Most importantly, I want to call on all the parents to make sure that girls do not have to go through this. To make sure they empower them and tell them that it's okay to say no. To support them, to believe in them and never, never blame them or they are the victims. And finally, I just want to thank everyone, all those great men that I cannot mention, but they know themselves. They stood by me, they helped me go through everything, they gave me advice to my family, and not doubt us, because I know many will be there to doubt the women, but these are things we've been through, and you don't have to go through them to believe those. I thank you all very much. Thank you very much indeed, um, uh, Madam Witness, and uh, uh, we hope that our process here would um, bring justice, reconciliation, and uh, healing to victims, especially uh, um, the victims in the categories that have been uh, discussed um, here have been exposed, we hope that uh, we find a way of not having these kind of things repeated again in our country here. But I uh, thank you again so much. You're a very brave lady to come and talk about mm -hmm. your suffering and the abuses that you endured. Uh, mm -hmm. Council, if you have uh, another point to make before I adjourn the meeting, please go ahead. Um, it's purely a procedural matter. I would like to tender the protected information sheet into evidence as Exhibit 0093. 
Um, yes, thank you very much. Request granted. There are no further points. We would take a lunch break, one hour. Thank, thank you again you. so much. Meeting is adjourned.